Pizarro conquered the Incan Empire and is really responsible for the expansion of Spanish dominion into the western side of South America. Spanish conquistador and explorer Francisco Pizarro was born in Trujillo, Spain in 1474. Coming from an impoverished family with few prospects, Pizarro traveled to Hispaniola to seek his fortune in the New World. In the early years, Francisco Pizarro gained experience and befriended Núñez de Balboa, who set up in an expedition in 1513, which ended up with the European discovery of the Pacific Ocean. After his travels with Balboa, he settled in Panama City, where he became quite wealthy. Hearing rumors of vast Inca riches in South America, Pizarro became partners with Diego de Almagro and began a series of explorations to search for them. Pizarro made three expeditions to Peru. On the first expedition, it uh, was largely not successful. On the second expedition, they managed to acquire three Incan youths whom Pizarro uh, trained uh, as translators. Pizarro then sailed to Spain to secure a promise from King Charles V to make him governor of any new territories he might discover. Returning to Peru in 1530, Pizarro found the Incans embroiled in a civil war, as well as suffering from the first major epidemic of smallpox. Pizarro took advantage of the situation to move directly to Cajamarca, where one of the kings, Atahualpa, resided. Pizarro takes him prisoner and demands ransom that a room about 22 feet by 17 be filled with gold and silver. Atahualpa keeps his promise. Pizarro takes no chances. He orders the execution of Atahualpa. Pizarro consolidated his control of the Inca Empire with the conquest of Cuzco in 1533, and then founded what is today Lima, the capital of Peru. After the conquest of the Incan Empire, Pizarro and Almagro fell out. This resulted in a series of battles between the two sides. Eventually, Almagro was captured. Pizarro's brother ordered the execution of Diego de Almagro. Almagro's family retaliated by having Pizarro himself assassinated. Francisco Pizarro, governor of Peru and Marquis of New Castile, was assassinated June 1541. Pizarro came from poverty. He was illiterate. He was illegitimate. And yet, because of all the possibilities in the new world, he rose to richness and fame. A little short little video clip, of course, on Francisco Pizarro, who would later, of course, conquer, uh, uh, Inc, of course, Inca Empire in Peru. So anyway, welcome you back, of course, Daniel Simon at BRCC. I uh, hope you're having a great week out there. Uh, okay. Uh, of course, week four, of History 1123 class. Of course, overall. So, anyway, yeah, this week I will, of course, continue uh, talking about the, you know, the Spanish conquistadors. So they, of course, come to the Americas in the uh, 16th century. So we'll get to that, of course, in a little bit uh, about that. So it looks like we got a few students uh, watching live right now. It looks like I know Madison's watching on Streamyard, and also I think on YouTube as well. Oh uh, yeah, looks like Mel. Hey, what's going on? Hope you're having a great morning. Yeah, Saints there. Uh, of course, Kiera. Hey, what's going on? Uh, Madison, hey, of course, again, um, it's like Diamond, uh, Chandler, good morning, uh, Zhang, of course, Pooh, uh, Trey, uh, Vincent, uh, of course, Chastity, uh, Brooke, Natalie, and it looks like also we've got a few others joining us, Fernanda, and of course, also Christine as well. So, hope everybody's having a great week out there, uh, I guess, okay. <laughs> Anyway, so um, yeah, this week, uh, I think I had some reminders out there for you about assignments. I know this week we have most of that exploration quiz to get out the way. And then uh, I do am, am posting a new quiz today, of course, on the conquest of America, conquistadors, of course, which I'm wrapping up today. Uh, so that'll be probably due sometime next week. I think y'all have got vocab coming up. I know uh, that's due. Uh, as well. So it's kind of talking about reminders about different assignments. Uh, I think the vocabs I want to say is due at the end of next week because they got pushed back, you know, because of uh, they pushed back with semester a week. Uh, looks like also a few other Chelsea's also joining us in Sierra. Hey, good morning. Uh, also uh, as well. So uh, anyway, like I said, I'm going to talk about, you know, this part two uh, aspect of, uh, I guess, the conquest of America today. I'll kind of get into, we'll continue talking about uh, some of the famous conquistadors. 
Uh, primarily, I'll first talk about, uh, of course, you know, Francisco Pizarro. Now, the guy's kind of over my left shoulder there, that famous picture, that painting, of course, that was done years ago. We'll kind of get into like early colonialism because, you know, the Spanish come in afterwards. They start colonizing a lot of good good chunk of America, especially in Latin America. So I'll kind of get into that today uh, with that. Uh, so if you have any comments, questions during the live stream, let me know. And or you can always leave me comments later uh, on my channel. Uh, of course, we have discussion later we'll have as well uh, about some of the study guide questions I've got, got too. So, yeah, you can also subscribe to my channel. Uh, as well. So if you want to join me in StreamYard right now, uh, Broadcast Booth, uh, there, of course, is the link uh, below uh, also as well. So anyway, like I said, I'm going to continue talking about uh, the conquest of America. Of course, I'll get into, we'll talk about Francisco Pizarro. Pizarro and Cortez, you know, the two most famous uh, conquistadors uh, that really tore into the Americas uh, and, of course, you know, conquered parts of Mexico and also, of course, part of South America, where Peru is, of course, today. And I think we have kind of already had started talking a little bit, I know, about the statue of Pizarro there, which is in Lima, Peru. Uh, that's on the left. Um, and uh, anyway, um, kind of, kind of. I think we had kind of talked a little bit about, you know, Pizarro's background. Uh, I think I had discussed how uh, he was originally born uh, in the city of Trujillo, uh, which is like in Western Spain, kind of like what you know happened with Cortez was kind of in the same area, except Medellin, you know, of course. And, and um, as you know, he would conquer the Inca Empire. The Inca Empire uh, was this vast, you know, Peruvian state. It was like in Peru, uh, Ecuador. It stretched all the way down into uh, like I think Chile and maybe even part of Argentina at one point, but mostly along the spine of the Andes Mountains. And uh, the reason why they're called Inca later uh, is because of the fact that uh, their their ruler or emperor was called an Inca, hence the name being used. But actually, they were called the Quechua people uh, because of the fact that they were uh, spoke that language, which is now called Quechua, which is still spoken, by the way, uh, in aspects of you know that part of South America uh, overall. There's Pizarro uh, on the right. Uh, I think we had kind of talked about that famous, uh, where was that? I think that picture I thought I had, I don't know if I still have it or not. Oh, Pizarro, there it is right there. The famous, uh, I think I told you about that story about how uh, he and his men were stuck on this island that was off the coast of South America. And uh, a lot of the men wanted to go back to Panama. Remember that? <laughs> and, uh, he told them, you know, hey, either we go to, you know, Peru and find our riches, or you guys can go back to Panama and live in poverty, that kind of thing. And I think I told you there were only 13 men uh, that crossed that famous line of the sand. Uh, they did have a nickname. Uh, they were called the Famous 13, uh, or Los Trece de la Fama, <clears throat> I guess, in Spanish. Uh, and uh, they're the ones that would actually invade uh, into of course, South America, Peru, uh, with with Pizarro in 1527, which took him like almost like three expeditions to actually get down uh, in, into South America. Uh, they did talk about some of his, uh, in that little video, I kind of, since I showed that video, uh, there were different men that were involved with him. They were, they were talking about Diego de Almagro. That was one of his business partners uh, that was involved uh, in the conquest of Peru. Well, the two later kind of came to loggerheads because they kind of fought over Peru afterwards. And remember, Pizarro later had him killed, of course, because of that. And I think one of his son later killed him, uh, Pizarro. So kind of it's like the mafia down there, the way it was kind of run uh, before the crown kind of reeled things in and tried to kind of create more control. <clears throat> oh, they had also the Pizarro brothers. I'll mention them, too. Uh, they were involved with Pizarro as well. Juan, Gonzalo, uh, Hernando, and, and then, of course, Hernando de Soto. Don't forget about him. He was involved in aiding Pizarro in conquering uh, Peru as well. He got very wealthy. He's one of the most wealthiest of the conquistadors uh, before he got killed in North America. Remember, he's the guy that found Mississippi River, of course. But um, now I'm going to get into, of course, and talk more about 
uh, Pizarro's expedition uh, in into Peru. Uh, he took a small force. I don't really go into that probably into the video <clears throat> itself, but the force was like something like 168 men uh, that he originally brought with him, uh, which is, I think, way less than what uh, Cortez used to conquer Mexico. They had all his weapons and, of course, smallpox and diseases kind of helped them too uh, in the conquest as well. And you can see there, he went down to the city of, it's called Caja Marca, uh, which is kind of like in part of, I think, northern Peru today. And uh, that's where they met the ruler of the Incas, the emperor, which is Atahualpa. And they would actually attack him and capture him. It was more like a massacre. You look at the fact that the uh, Spanish had just better better arms than, than they did. And... Um, Here's an image, of course, of Pizarro that's on the left right there. Uh, Pizarro would be captured, like I said in the video. And uh, Ad Alpa was kind of concerned that he, was, he would be killed uh, by um, uh, Pizarro. And so he offered a ransom, we saw in the video. And I think the room was like, um, I think I've got a picture of the ransom room if you want to see it. Uh, it's actually about, about, I think they said the size it was 22 feet by 17 feet long. Uh, they didn't say the height, but it's about nine feet high, I think was how tall I think the room was. And he actually filled it with gold and silver, which I think it took him like, I want to say a few weeks uh, for them, to, like maybe maybe two months at the most to, to fill it. And, and uh, in the end, you can see there the amount of you know, gold at least was 24 tons. And then you add the silver in there. I think it was even more than that, uh, that they, you know, would eventually uh, give give over to Bizarro, which I think might be worth $850 million today. Uh, maybe more than that. Maybe more closer to a billion dollars now. That might be inflated now, of course, because of the last few years. Uh, but he thought that, you know, Bizarro would, you know, save him and not kill him and, of course, I think in the next year, he later had him killed, uh, had him executed. So that's kind of the sad story about Ada Alba, of course, about what happened about with, with him. Uh, after that, uh, Ada Alba, uh, after his death, P uh, Pizarro then moved on uh, to, of course, take what is the capital of Cusco, uh, which was like south of uh, Cajamarca. The date was November 15th, uh, 15th. 33, when he would capture, of course, uh, Cusco. Uh, I think I'll kind of get to the Inca Rebellion uh, in a second here. Uh, but but Cusco, um, I thought I had a picture of Cusco somewhere. I guess, I guess I don't. Uh, but later he would go on to found also Peru. That's, of course, the other thing that, you know, Pizarro was very famous for, uh, which I think was, I think that was in the next year, uh, which was in, uh, 15 what was the year he founded it, 1530, I think it was 30, 34. Uh, it was when he would found uh, Lima on the Pacific Ocean. And so that later kind of becomes the capital of Peru, one of the main cities that will kind of be part of the uh, vice royalty of Peru uh, in, in the Spanish controlling, of course, the New World in South America. And that's the historic center, of course, uh, that was initially, I guess, first built uh, after Pizarro was, of course, conquered it, uh, that you're looking at right there. Uh, now, what happened uh, afterwards, though, um, uh, after uh, Adalpa was killed, uh, they had this other uh, ruler that he put in power named Manco Inca, which you see at the top left there. Uh, Manco Inca was a brother of Adalpa uh, in he was put in as this puppet ruler uh, to kind of allow Pizarro to kind of control, uh, you know, the Inca state and take over Peru. It's kind of like what Cortes did with Montezuma in Mexico, kind of tried to do the same thing with the Aztecs. And so for like the next 10, 10 11 years or so, actually the next two or three years, I think it was, uh, he tried to control, you know, basically, out of, basically a Manco Inca's empire. Uh, and uh, but you see there uh, what happened was February 1536, Manco Inca decided to rebel. Uh, he actually formed like an army to, to fight against um, 
Pizarro. Uh, and uh, you can see it massed close to 200,000 Inca warriors. They tried to retake Cusco, you know, the cap capital of, of Peru, of the, of the Inca Empire. Uh, and um, anyway, it led to the so-called Siege of Cusco, which lasts from like, they think, maybe around May of 1536. And it actually lasted till March 1537, like nine, 10 months uh, that it kind of went on. And it was a fortress. They, they tried, they actually, I think at one point, they did take it back uh, at one point. So I think I've got an image of it right here, uh, which is, um, it's called the Saxon a fortress uh, that's in Cusco today. I think I've got a better image of some of the stones that were part of the fortification, which some of those stones weigh like tons, like really heavy, because uh, a lot of the Incas, you know, built houses out of stone, uh, which was something that was kind of impressive, you know, to uh, the Spanish. Uh, but in the end, the, the rebellion, it actually failed. They, they weren't able to basically take, you know, back, you know, control of, of, of Cusco. Uh, and I think Pizarro got reinforcements uh, at that point. Uh, and so uh, the, the whole thing failed. Uh, now, what happened, though, was Manco Inca then fled. He didn't stay there, you know, in Cusco with his, some of his men. Uh, he fled into the Andes Mountains uh, and into the jungles of Peru. And he created this uh, Neo-Inca state. He used to call it the Neo-Inca state of Vilcabamba. I think is the common common name they used to call it. Vilcabamba was this um, capital or city that he built in the jungles of Peru, kind of like in the northeastern part of Peru is where it was. And it was later called the Lost City of the Incas. I think I've got, got an image uh, of, of, I think, what it, well, one of the images of it, I think, that they kind of sometimes show. Uh, but it's actually not it. Uh, it's Vidcos, I think, which is or, or also called Rosa Pata, I think, is the more modern name uh, they call it. But um, I think the real Vilcabama is actually in a jungle, like remains of it with the Spanish family, because the Spanish found it later, and then he had to move it, this other site, uh, which you're looking at right here. And uh, the Spanish later uh, found it. And they, I think it, one of the, I think it was a, I don't know who it was, but as a Spanish soldier later assassinated him, he, he basically killed it. Uh, so he was killed, uh, Manco Inca. And then they had one more ruler that they had that I sometimes mention about. Uh, he was also famous. And that's Tupac Amaru. You may have heard of him. Uh, he was basically uh, the last uh, really Inca emperor that they have. He was the son of Manco Inca. He reigned basically 1545 to 72. <clears throat> he had basically tried to continue the Neo-Inca state uh, that, of course, uh, Manco Inca had started, but they later found him too. The Spanish captured him and they later murdered him too, uh, as well. You might heard, heard of the name Tupac, right? Uh, there's a famous rapper, you know, who kind of got that name uh, later, of course, later killed too, as you know, modern times, that's where the name originated from, uh, from him, Tupac Amaru. <clears throat> so anyway, a little side story. Um, oh, of course, uh, another thing that uh, supposedly, if you know about the Incas that they're really famous for is Machu Picchu. Uh, Machu Picchu is this famous uh, Inca citadel uh, that was built in the 15th century, because the Incas go back to the 1400s uh, in South America, Built by one of their earlier kings, the emperors, uh, and it was high up in the Andes Mountains. And suppose the Spanish never found it. Uh, and uh, it was actually found in 1911 by this American archaeologist named Hiram Bingham, who was kind of traveling through there trying to find different Incan sites. And of course, um, it's real famous today, real big tourist attraction. People like to, of course, go see Machu Picchu, but it's not really a city, it's more like a citadel. Uh, and kind of like a sanctuary or or residence of one of the kings or emperors. So so anyway, um, that's basically the story of you know what happened to basically you know the uh, the Inca state. It gets conquered, of course, and then uh, the Spanish come in afterwards and begin trying to colonize. But yeah, the, the Inca people, like the Quechua people, of course, are 
are still there, you know, today, uh, overall. It's like Leslie's, uh, hey, Leslie, what's going on? So anyway, um, so I'm going to continue, uh, of course, uh, talking some more, of course, about this period. Of course, there's Lima. Now, I want to get into today and talk about the uh, Spanish uh, vice royalties that are kind of set up uh, afterwards uh, and um, kind of get into that and talk about, about that that issue. Uh, and um, the um, what happened after uh, after the initial conquests, uh, the Spanish would set up a bunch of vice royalties there, which were colonies uh, that were, of course, mostly in Latin America. A lot of these were also all over, not just in uh, the Americas, but throughout pretty much the whole world uh, overall. Now, usually all the colonies were called as the, the Portuguese uh, also had uh, vice royalties uh, as well. Uh, and um, the two main ones they set up initially were, of course, uh, Peru. Uh, of course, you see on the one we just talked about, uh, which Lima was, of course, uh, the main one they had, main capital of it. And then, of course, the other was uh, New Spain, uh, which was Mexico City. New Spain, by the way, uh, was, a, if you look at that map there, included a bunch of areas, uh, which uh, were uh, pretty much the Caribbean was part of it, uh, also Mexi Mexico, uh, and then also even at one point part of Central America was in it too. And then also the Philippines, they included the Philippines uh, were part of it uh, as well. So it had like a bunch of different areas that they controlled. I think Guam was also in, included in New Spain. New Spain was really the biggest and most important, you know, colony really the Spanish had uh, the New World or part of the other parts of the world uh, with Mexico City being really one of its major cities uh, that, that, of course, Cortes first founded uh, after, that, after the conquest of the Aztecs. Uh, they all had some other ones too. You can see in that map as well. Of course, you got the vice royalty of Brazil, which the Portuguese have uh, also. But uh, yeah, the Spanish added some other ones later. They had the vice royalty of New Granada. You can see that was in the northern part of South America. It also includes part of Central America. Uh, you can see going up to like Nicaragua, and then also New. Uh, Yes, that's new. So yeah, yeah, New Granada, and then they had the other one. So yeah, Colombia, Ecuador, Panama, Venezuela, and then going up into Nicaragua. Uh, those, and they also had the Vice Royalty of Rio de la Plata, which is named after the Platte River uh, or Plate River uh, down there by um, where uh, Buenos Aires is today. That included like Argentina, Chile, Bolivia, Paraguay, and Uruguay. So all those areas were areas that would eventually separate, which. Those would not be developed until the 18th century, uh, both, both those other two uh, vice royalties that they would basically set up. Uh, now, the, why were they called vice royalties? Well, the vice royalties were called this because of the fact that basically uh, it was run by a governor, a royal governor uh, that was called a viceroy. So hence the name uh, being used because uh, the king couldn't be there in name. The king is obviously the main ruler of everything, you know, going back to Spain, et cetera, or Portugal, uh, et cetera. Uh, but the royal governors, which a lot of them were mostly higher nobility, uh, were the ones that basically ruled in the king's name uh, primarily. Uh, also, uh, they had various courts. This was, they had the, uh, you can see there, they had the viceroy, and they had these things called the real audiencia, which were like these court systems. They had corregidor, was also a court system. Uh, the Real Audiencia, which means uh, royal audience in Spanish, uh, were a bunch of um, judicial councils which ran the colony, and they also were like an appeals court as well. Uh, and then the uh, corregidores were like municipal courts or local courts uh, that were also under uh, the Real Audiencias. I think it's called Audiencias for short uh, overall. Uh, most uh, of these colonies had a cabildo, which a cabildo uh, was like a consul uh, that ran a colony, uh, like a local administrative consul. And um, a lot of times, though, if you go down to New Orleans today, you'll see the cabildo building by the you know Jackson Square and all that. And that was put there, obviously, to run uh, the Spanish colonial government that was there in power when Spain controlled Louisiana uh, back in the late 18th century. 
Uh, so the term cabildo is kind of used uh, because of that. So that's kind of like kind of the hierarchy of, you know, you know, the Spanish government that was controlling, of course, uh, the New World and all that. Now, I'm going to also uh, move on to talk about uh, as well something that the uh, Spanish were kind of known for, uh, which is the so-called, they call it the, it's called different names, the caste system, or I think the other common name they'll say is the casta, or I guess the Spanish name total is Sistema de Castas. I think it was the common name that they usually use for it. And it was this hierarchy system of dividing the colonial population based off of their race, ethnicity. Uh, that's where a lot of this came from, you know, about uh, race in modern times today, uh, et cetera. Wasn't really a big thing, you know, in ancient medieval times, but uh, after the Spanish came to the Americas, you know, it became a big deal because you had all these different peoples that were already there. And then you had people that mixed with other cultures or peoples. Uh, so they had to kind of break people down uh, into different uh racial classifications, and it kind of became also like a social class system as well, because uh, you can see that pyramid kind of on the on the left, bottom left right there, where it kind of shows the order of things. So you got these uh, people called peninsulars that are at the top. Uh, you got the Creoles that are kind of below them. Then you got people that are mestizos, mulattoes that are below them. And then on the bottom is the labor, of course, which a lot of those are Indian and African mostly for the labor, of course, that were brought in. Uh, and um, so, yeah, your peninsulars were a mix. The, the two top ones were the peninsulars and the um, Criollo. Uh, basically, I think so. They actually say it in Spanish, uh, which I guess they use sometimes the, the French version, which is Creole uh, as well. But it's not quite the same thing uh, as, say, like a French or Spanish Creole, or really French Creole, uh, I guess, in, say, Louisiana a long time ago. Like, I'm part French Creole myself, but um, these are Europeans with higher status because they were born uh, in, in either Spain or Portugal, uh, or uh, they're basically uh, Spanish or Portuguese that were born in America. So kind of either one is basically uh, what they are. So peninsulars are usually the ones that are born on the Iberian Peninsula, like Cortez, Pizarro, Fernando de Soto, those kind of people. Uh, basically would be that. And then Creoles would be like, say, if, you know, Bazaar had children uh, in the New World uh, that was pure Spanish, uh, he would be a Criollo, basically, uh, is what it is. Uh, now, they have also what they call a mestizo. Mestizo is like a racial mixture of, like, European uh, and Indian. Uh, you have, and there's different mixtures. Uh, you, you could have a um, you know, I think they call it Castillo or something like that, uh, like someone who's like more Spanish than Indian. And then you could have somebody who's more Indian uh, than Spanish. So there's different mixtures of it uh, that you can have. Uh, mulatto is like a mixture of African and European. So it could be Spanish, it could be French, it could be Portuguese, whatever. Uh, that's that's what they would consider like a you know, maybe sometimes uh Creole, like in Louisiana, might be more like mulatto, it could be. But you could have white Creole versus, like I said, black Creole. So those kind of things uh, also. Uh, on the bottom, you have mostly those that were like either, you know, Indian or black, you know, African descent, Negro. Uh, and um, they're considered like the lowest caste. Uh, they were brought in, you know, as labor uh, pretty much either from the Americas or from Africa. Uh, and so... That's how the Spanish kind of broke people down uh, into different classifications. Well, uh, they do kind of show like sometimes these paintings of the different, you know, racial classifications, uh, which they gave nicknames and all that. But there are different kinds of racial, I think up to like as many as like 16 versions or whatever they had uh, in the Americas. And it's kind of similar to uh, like, the, I think when the Portuguese uh, and the uh, British went into India, they got the caste system over there, too. So it's kind of like breaking people down on uh, different castes and things like that over there. Uh, although I think the word casta, uh, it can mean things like lineage uh, or even the word, I think sometimes it means pure also uh, as well. But I think lineage 
is com com commonly the translation uh, from Spanish or Portuguese. Now, I want to get into something else that's kind of infamous, you know, about, about the you know, Spanish when they went into the New World, which you may have heard about, uh, which is the um, encomienda system. Uh, it's very notorious, you know, uh, in, in, of course, uh, the Americas. Uh, and uh, it was this forced labor system uh, that the Spanish developed um, and uh, where they took all the Native Americans and forced them to do slave labor, like working in mines and plantations uh, and so on. And you can see there on the left there, if you look at it, uh, it, of course, you've got this thing here. The plan was that Spanish settlers would protect and they would, you know, take care of Native Americans. They would Christianize them. That was primarily uh, what it was. And if you're a co colonialist like um, I think Cortez, I think was one example, uh, came to the Americas, uh, you could become what they call an encomendero, uh, where you were given land and so many slaves, and you were supposed to take care of them. <laughs> and then in the end, what they did was they exploited them, basically. And so they used them a lot for slave labor, uh, et cetera. And so that's the reality of what really happened. And so a lot of these Native Americans, you know, would end up, a lot of them, a lot of them um, died uh, from uh, disease, being worked to death. Uh, there's different uh, numbers on that. I was looking at Yale University. had done a study on this years ago. Uh, they estimated anywhere from 2 to 15 million uh, Native Americans, Latin America, may have, may have died uh, because of this uh, income in the system and the, the disease that wiped them out, uh, like smallpox uh, and so on. And uh, so basically, um, part of why they thought they could do this, uh, by the way, the income in system, part of why they thought they could do this was they thought they were, because they were non Christian, uh, they believed it was the right thing. But they weren't, you know, they were pagan or worshiping, you know, idols and other things like that. They weren't, weren't Christian, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, also human sacrifice. Human sacrifice. Uh, also, I think cannibalism, I think someone may have done as well. So they used that as an excuse, basically, to uh, reward the conquerors with their slave labor. Uh, of course, there was this man that came along, you may have heard of, named Bartholomew de las Casas, uh, who you see there. Uh, he's kind of instrumental. Uh, he, 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 of course, was later known as the um, protector of the Indians, they called him. I think I've got another image right here of las Casas. I'll get back to that in a second. But uh, apparently there was this big argument over, like, especially in the you know 16th century, about whether, you know, they ought to keep Indian slavery and, you know, what's the rights of, of basically of, of, you know, they have Americans. Should they be like, you know, real people or should they use as slaves? And um, he was pretty instrumental in getting uh, the income in the system banned uh, for being cruel, uh, ending slavery. Uh, and uh, it le later led to the so-called new laws 1542, uh, which were issued by Emperor Charles V, who was also the King of Spain. That's Carlos I or Charles I. And um, so he was he heavily influential on this, uh, so-called protector of the Indians. And uh, he had written a book about it. I think it's mentioned right here, but he had actually gone to the, um, I guess what they call the West Indies, like in the Caribbean, he wrote a book about it called The Brief Account of the Devastation of the Indies, how the Spanish had gone in there, and because of the treatment of the Indians and, of course, all the disease, they had wiped out most of the Native Americans there. Uh, and so uh, he wrote, like, a book about it, and it became kind of popular, I know, in Spain. And it led to a big debate. Uh, they call it either the philatelid debate or uh, some people call it the philatelid controversy, uh, where he argued in front of uh, King Charles about, you know, what's the issue with the Indians? Should they be treated, you know, like real people? Uh, should they have rights? Uh, should they not be enslaved? Uh, things like that. And, um, of course, he had opposition against him, saying that, yeah, they should, because uh, they practice human sacrifice, uh, cannibalism, and things like that, and they, a lot of them weren't Christian. 
Uh, but he was saying, hey, we're starting to convert them to Christianity, uh, and they're coming more like Spanish, uh, and so uh, they shouldn't they shouldn't be treated like like they are. Uh, the only bad thing, though, about uh, Las Casas, if you know about him, uh, is that he said that, you know, what they ought to do instead is bring in Africans as slaves, African slavery, you know, replace Indian slavery. And that's what they actually do uh, over time, at, you know, the Spanish uh, and the Americas. You see this a lot. Also, the Portuguese do it and others. And so African slavery becomes basically uh, replaced, replaced Indian slavery. So they couldn't like handle disease and Africans were better also at doing labor and things like that, you know, intensive labor, uh, et cetera. So that's the, on the negative side of it. The only thing about that. Uh, the only thing about what happened with, um, they eventually got rid of it. Although there was, I think some attempts I know in the Americas to try to bring it back, uh, the income, the end system. But uh, for a while, the Spanish had this system called the, a uh, repartimento system uh, that was developed, which was managed by the crown. It was kind of like this tribute system that was kind of like, uh, it's very similar to the, have you heard of the Corby system that they had in, in, in like the uh, old world, like in France, they had the Corby system where it was this like tribute labor where you would have to give so much labor uh, to the crown, to the, to the monarchy. Might be, it might be a week, it might be a month, it might be a few months uh, in return. And, um, and so that's kind of what replaced it initially uh, at first, uh, the Apartimento system. Uh, and then what happened was they eventually brought in this other thing called the Hacienda, which you may have heard of. Uh, the Haciendas were these large estates that they began to establish uh, in the Americas, uh, where the owners, Hacienda Dados, I guess they called it, uh, would basically pay laborers, which they weren't paid much, though. That's the only bad thing. Uh, but it wasn't like slave labor. Uh, they were kind of considered free, uh, like Indians. But of course, a lot of people, Africans and others were brought in too, also to work on these plantations eventually. But uh, of course, uh, you know, the big thing, you know, with the Spanish and I guess others uh, were sugar, sugar cane, you know, plantations, which were, of course, big uh, in like the Americas and the Caribbean and all that. And that's where a majority of African slaves were brought to work, uh, was in to make you know make sugar and all that. So so anyway, um, that's kind of what that was uh, with that. Uh, now yeah, the uh, Spanish uh, Empire uh, was was pretty pretty massive. I think I've got where's that picture showing? Uh, there's kind of like the the Latin American one uh, that they've got right there. But they they say uh, what happens later? They have this colonial boom that the Spanish had uh, in in Latin America. Uh, and so their whole empire, you know, goes from like California, uh, New Mexico, actually at one point, Texas and Florida, they control it at one point, Louisiana, down in New Mexico, Central America, most of South America, minus Brazil uh, as well. The Caribbean, also Philippines, uh, Guam, uh, et cetera, and the Pacific. So you can see that, yeah, their empire peaked at 5 million square miles later in 1810. So uh, they were at one point one of the largest uh, empires in the world. So they had a pretty massive one, but compared to like the British and some other empires like the French, et cetera, uh, they would actually decline. Uh, they won't, won't be such a big power uh, overall. Uh, there was a legend, the story you may have heard about the Spanish that's kind of well known. Uh, it's called the Black Legend. And some, some kind of story they start talking about Spanish Empire later uh, about the fact that the uh, empire had been built off of like um, being evil, being cruel, exploitation of people, which maybe was semi, somewhat somewhat true, but just about every empire did that. The British did it and other empires did it too. French did it uh, also as well. A lot of it was like anti-Catholic, uh, anti-Spanish propaganda. It wasn't really true, uh, but it's something that kind of stuck and people kind of still think of when they think of the Spanish Empire. They talk about the black legend and all that. Uh, you can, uh, of course, part of why Latin America boomed, uh, agriculture, yeah, that was one thing they had, like, you know, making sugar and all that. But uh, really the big thing was gold and silver mining, like in Mexico 
Uh, and in Peru, especially silver, I think was pretty big. And I know in, I think pretty much in Mexico and part of Peru as well, but um, it led to a big boom in colonialism. So a lot of people, you know, left, they left um, Spain to come to the Americas and there's kind of a brain drain Spanish actually have, and it leads to the decline of their state uh, and all that. And it was heavily taxed. Uh, they always talk about the Quinto Rio, uh, the so-called, they call it the King's Fifth. Uh, they usually dub it. And the King's Fifth was like this uh, tax on mineral rights, which was, I think, something like about 20% is what it was originally at first. Uh, I guess going back to, the, I guess, the 16th century. Later, they decreased it 10%, and it may have dropped down to maybe 3% at one point. But it was a good chunk of the Spanish Empire's revenue. Uh, they came in from all this gold they stole, you know, from the Americas. That's why the Spanish built all those um, galleon ships, like those treasure ships you hear about uh, that were always lost around the Atlantic and the Caribbean that people always find, I guess, treasure hunters or whatever. Uh, and uh, so basically that's, that's of course, the, the, the Spanish Empire. And they'll control it for a long time. You look at that map, of course, on the right. The Spanish control Latin America. Uh, up to like most of it was controlled up to like the early 19th century uh, before they had those Latin American revolutions where uh, they broke away. They formed independent states. So later, all those areas you're looking at uh, are going to break away. Mexico uh, will break away. Uh, Haiti was one of the first states, I think, that broke away, uh, which I think at one point was controlled by the French. But um all those Central American states you've heard about, um, you know, El Salvador, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Honduras, Panama, they'll eventually break away. Colombia, Venezuela, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, Brazil, Paraguay, Uruguay, uh, Chile, Argentina, that's the majority of them you're looking at right there. Uh, that's basically all these states that will form. Later. Brazil will break away from Portuguese uh, also as well uh, overall. So, but that'll be later, you know. When that when that happens, uh, more or less with the America, but yeah, Spain for a long time controlled. And today, you know, in pretty much Latin America, majority of uh, Latin America uh, either speaks speak Spanish or Portuguese. Most people are Catholic because you know, when, of course, they went in there, uh, they converted everybody to, of course, uh, the Catholic faith, etc. So, anyway, um, now. Uh, Next week, I'll kind of I'll kind of be moving on. Uh, of course, I think our next thing we'll be talking about is the age of absolutism. So I'll kind of talk about the rise of the French Empire, French state uh, under the Bourbon dynasty. I'll kind of get into like Louis the Fourteenth and his regime, uh, and I'll also talk about uh, as well the rise of the Habsburgs. So I'm kind of getting into talking about the Spanish right now, but you have the Spanish Habsburgs and their empire. Uh, they had which Charles V was instrumental developing course. Now I'll talk about the um, Habsburg monarchy in Austria, Austria Habsburgs they have as well. We'll get, get into that uh, topic uh, also. Uh, before we go, don't forget, uh, I think I had some reminders about assignments. I know you got the expiration quiz uh, that's still out there. And in the Conquest of America quiz, uh, that's of course, like I said, I'm gonna post that today. Uh, that'll be due, uh, of course, uh, next, next week. Uh, so, Kind of a shorter lecture today uh, overall, but I don't think there's any questions uh, pretty much I've got live stream wise, but uh, that's it for today. Uh, if y'all have any comments, uh, questions, of course, about this uh, lecture, you know, please let me know. Of course, uh, probably will be some discussion questions probably coming up too, also about this lecture as well in discussions on Canvas. But that's it for the week. Uh, y'all have, of course, a great, great weekend uh, coming up. Uh, and I'll, of course, see y'all uh, next week. So y'all take care. See y'all later.